was again the national low income housing coalition as she talked about 35 dollars an hour you need it to, in order to afford a two bedroom apartment um so how would raising the minimum wage help floridian workers who are already struggling to pay rent because the thing is a lot of times people will, will say well if you raise the minimum wage then everything else is going to go up that's just talk to any economist that's not how it works just raising the minimum wage doesn't make everything go up exactly the same amount it just it does not work that way i <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry um but at the same time the what i brought up there in housing affordability because i'm a realtor so i i see what happens we've got new neighborhoods popping up around here all over the place and there was a neighborhood um wildlight uh, or over by wildlight which is our new big cool thing Ryanair was kind enough to give a whole bunch of land uh so that they could get tax breaks and tax subsidies and all these fancy things when they were like oh we'll we'll cut down some pine trees and let you build a neighborhood anyway but there was a new neighborhood i talked to one of the site agents there uh, and she said that she had just written a contract for 15 homes not built yet 15 homes and they were going to make them rentals immediately and that's not that's not a one-off that happened a lot over the last few years people coming in and just buying houses cash with the intention of taking a brand new house and turning it immediately into a rental property. And you know why they do that? Do you know why they do that? I can tell you exactly why they do that. It's not for cash flow, it's for that tax write off. So every house that they buy, there's a tax write off. And I've, I've owned rental properties. And I can tell you when I did my taxes, every year, every year on paper, I lost money. On paper, I lost money. But I still got a tax deduction for every rental property that I had. And I paid lower taxes, even though I was losing money on, on the houses, but I was putting money in my bank account every single month. Does that make sense? Does that really make sense? Thank you so very much for being on the show. Hey, JB, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to get into and ask you about first is why are you running for Congress now? <laughs> All right. So do you want the long version or the short version? <laughs> Either way you got. <laughs> All right. So um, I, I grew up in a union family. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Anderson, Indiana. It was a UAW town. We were uh, upper middle class. Everyone in the town thrived because the union was there. Um, in the nineties after NAFTA passed, um, the town started to degrade and it started to go to the go to the point where now it's just a stop on the interstate um so i joined the navy and i was in the navy from 1998 to 2018 the end of 2018 i retired and so I, growing up in a uaw family and then moving immediately into the military i thought just everyone had basic needs met. I, I got into the kind of the military bubble. I thought that everyone just had the things that we had. Um, until 2016, when uh, a gentleman, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, uh, Bernard Sanders, I believe is his name, <laughs> <laughs> was running in 2016. And when I started to follow his campaign, um, I came to the realization that the country that I thought that I was serving just does not exist. It, it's not out there. Um, and again, being grown up in a, in a union family, I had health insurance growing up. My mom kept my dad's health insurance. He passed away when I was nine, but she mm -hmm. kept his health insurance. She kept benefits because the UAW was so good because the union negotiated yeah. all of those good contracts back in the day. She still actually gets survivor benefits from them. Wow. Um, but like I said, I thought everyone just had that. I took for granted that everyone had that uh, until much later in life. I didn't even realize how bad it was. After I retired, um, I got into real estate because I was like, I want, I want my time back. After being a submariner for 21 years, you kind of want a little bit of your life back. So I got my real estate license and started practicing real estate in Northeast Florida and Southeast Georgia because we've got a base right here uh, in Kings Bay. 
And I wanted to help younger, stupider me, <laughs> if I can say that politely, because I was always just a paycheck as a, as a guy who was military, who could get the VA loan. I was always just a paycheck when I bought and sold houses and I wanted to be something different. Yeah. And then I started working with real people. When you get your real estate license, you start working with real people um, outside of the bubble that, that I had been in. And I started to see how badly people are struggling and working with renters and specifically how hard it is just to get by, just to meet your very, very basic needs. And I work with kids because Hilliard and Callahan are up here. They're, they're pretty uh, rural. I hate that word, but they're, they're like good old farm country, good old back town kind of easy going places. And there are kids that grew up there that have to move to Georgia to be able to afford rent or to be able to afford to buy a house because it's 60 or 70 grand cheaper just to go 15 minutes across the border. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started looking into our government here, our local government. Um, and it's a good old boys club. You just get who you're going to get in 2022 our, after the redistricting, we had John Rutherford and we got redistricted in the 2022 election. The Democrat who tried, it's LaShonda Holloway. She's the same one who's running this time. And, uh, it's a, it's a plus 20 district. So we're just going to get the guy that we get. He was the mayor, Aaron Bean, who I'm running against. He was the mayor of Fernandina and it was, it was just, everyone knows his family. He's old money. He's, he's been, his family's been in the area and he was just the next guy who was in line for the congressional seat. No one likes him, but he has an R next to his name. So in a plus 20 district, he's going to be the guy we get. Mm -hmm. When I decided that I was thinking about running for this election, I reached out to LaShonda Holloway uh, because she had run in 22. The Democrats deigned to give her $10,000 against his 1.1 million. I think is what he, what he hauled in and, uh, 22 in a newly districted seat, newly districted, and they didn't even want to fight for it. They didn't even want to try the Democrats. That is, they didn't even wow. want to give it any kind of effort, gave her $10,000. So I reached out to her to be like, it's a plus 20 red district. I'd love to coordinate with you and figure out some way. Cause she obviously knows all the Democrats in, in Jacksonville, which is our big metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted her help. I wanted to work with her and she never got back to me. So I decided, okay, fine. Well, I guess I'm going to figure out the FEC requirements, figure out the Florida ballot requirements and, and put out my name and, and got everything set up so that I can run. Come to find out later, she, she decided to run too. And I tried to reach out to her again. So she's on the democratic ticket again. I tried to reach out to her again and say, look, a Democrat's not going to win here. It's just not going to work that way. And nothing. I haven't heard anything from her. And it was in good conscience that I, I tried. But uh, someone's got to do something. Because we've gotten to the point in this country where, especially I'm, I'm running ads and I'm getting so much vitriol from people who are saying that I'm a spoiler, saying that it's a waste of time to run. But I just want people to understand across the country, because I can't, I can't do this alone. Even if I got voted in, I'd be one vote out of 435. I can't change everything, but I can, I can run and I can show people that it is possible to run as an independent, look at your state rules or whatever. But I can tell you the FEC requirements for the national uh, requirements, they're not that bad. So I want people to see through my running that it can be done. It is possible. Um, and you just have to get through the noise of, of backlash that, and be willing to take it. Cause I've, I've had some very interesting conversations that I never thought I would have, um, with people telling me that I shouldn't be doing this and I'm ruining someone's life somehow because someone may vote for me and then the Republican may lose. It's just like, People need to get over themselves and look at the policies and, and look at the candidates. And yeah. I just want people to be able to see that it is possible to be done. That simple as that <laughs> so that we can hopefully get to a better place. And 
looking at uh, Dennis Kucinich run, looking at uh, Jose Vega, it only it would only take a few of our voices. We just saw, well, force the vote was a complete wash, but we just saw with the Republicans, it only took, what was it, 10 or 12 of them to yes. rock the house, to absolutely yes. bring it to its knees yeah. and get all of their demands. Yeah. So if and, we and had actual independents who were in there and we had 10 or 12 of them, just independents who don't take corporate money, and we drew a hard line. We work with who is doing the right thing and we work against who's not doing the right thing. Just a yeah. handful of us could get actual policy actually on the floor. It may not pass, but we could force it to happen. We could force the conversation and it wouldn't take that many of us. And a lot of people feel that that is impossible. Mm -hmm. And we need to get, get people over that hump, get people to realize that it is possible. We can take our government back. And if we did it in the Senate, it would only take three or four senators, maybe if that to, yeah. to completely shift the narrative in our country. So that's why I'm running. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. Actually, just uh, as as a reference, uh, what Matt Gates did to Kevin McCarthy really was a huge uh, eye opener for many people because a lot of us. So, as somebody, I am on the left. One of the things that we pushed was forced to vote. So, if anybody remembers, it was actually talked about first. Uh, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm blanking on his name but he was a football player for the San Diego Chargers. And he was somebody that supported Bernie and Medicare for all. And so he proposed to somebody like AOC and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, well, why don't you just force a vote on the floor? And so this caused a huge uh, back and forth on Twitter uh, about forcing the vote. So mm -hmm. then uh, people like Jimmy Dore got on board and they hosted what we call a forced to vote town hall, which we basically, you know, the, the left coalesced and said, we need to force a vote for yep. Medicare for all on the floor vote. And if we, and we will withhold our votes for confirming Nancy Pelosi as speaker, unless she concedes to put a floor vote for Medicare for all on the floor. And so despite the left coalescing around that, the congressional, Progressive Caucus did not follow suit. And so therefore they just fell in line for Nancy Pelosi. But yeah. you have people who are watching, who are on the outside looking in, and you saw people like Matt Gates, who did the exact same thing against Kevin McCarthy and got many concessions for the House Freedom Caucus for what they wanted. So Matt Gates and Republicans actually proved what we wanted to happen, happened. And then when Kevin McCarthy did not do what they wanted, then they ousted him as speaker and they were successful in doing so. So exactly. the thing is, is like what, you know, you're saying as well, Todd, is absolutely true, is the fact that is that you don't need very many. And the fact that, you know, you mentioned yourself, Dennis Kucinich and Jose Vega that are running as independents. And what if there are some that are running third party that you guys can coalesce around as well in order to be mm -hmm. able to force a vote on, let's say, stop arming Israel, right? You could do something like that. But the thing is, is that there is power in that small number, you know, and I, I think that's one of the importance of also running outside of duopoly because you're not yep. under that, that weight, right? Well, if you look at look, what was their payback? What was their payback for falling in line and voting for Nancy Pelosi? Look at every one of them. They, they just tried to primary every single one of them. Yes. They, they won against Jamal Bowman. They won yep. against Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar. She kept her seat, but I think, I think she's fit for that district, but they, they primaried her and she was just posting yesterday when the DNC convention started, just posting how wonderful it was to be at the DNC convention after they just did that to her. That's mm -hmm. disgusting. What kind of, what kind of, how do you sleep at night? If you can, if you can accept that and just say, well, this is, this is the party. This is what I've got to do. And it, it kills me. It absolutely kills me to see that happen. And Jamal Bowman was doing the same thing. Like yeah. within a week of his primary, he was coming out and shilling for Democrats again. 
after they they endorsed his opponent. It it makes me sick. It truly makes me sick. There's no yeah. there's no victory to be had inside the Democratic Party. There's just not. Yeah. And the crazy part is, is like, you know that your party doesn't like you. Exactly. And your party does not believe the same thing you believe. This is the wildest thing to me, is how can you be in a party that does not share your same values? Because yeah. my thing is, the values of the party are in the tangibles that you actually push through. It's not in, oh, this is what we aspire. This is what we believe. No, no, no. What did you actually pass? Exactly. What tangibles did you do for the people? That's the actual policy. Right. So people always go to me and go, well, the Democrats believe in. I don't care what they believe in. There's a lot of rapists that believe out there and consent. But when the time comes for you to consent, they don't believe in it when it comes when the rubber beats the road. The same thing with the Democratic yep. Party and the Republican Party. They actually do not believe in actual policies that they say they represent. Well, they're running they on represent. they're running on abortion again. 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 2000, 2008. Obama ran on that, and yes. then he came out within a few months after he took office and said it's not a top legislative priority, meh, whatever. They knew it was coming. The Republicans have said that they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade. They've said that for decades, and they promised, and they kept their promise. They, they've been saying, they've, they've told us, this is what our game plan is. We're going to get all of these judges. We're going to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's our plan, and they ended up doing it. And the Democrats have been promising for decades. We were going to codify Roe. We're going to make sure that that it, it, and then just gave up every chance because they have, they always have their their person who can't make it over the over the hump for the vote, right? They've yeah. they've always got the shill who they can say, oh well, he's he's a centrist Democrat, so he's not going to vote for that. Rrr, sorry, and it's every time they have that person, every time, conveniently. They have that person who's not going to allow it to pass. Even under Obama, when they had a super majority, they had enough people that, and they couldn't, they couldn't get rid of the filibuster because yeah. that would make it too easy to do things that people actually want. It's, mm -hmm. it's sad. It's sad to watch. Yeah. Um, God, I, one of the things sorry, I don't want to get frustrated. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I applaud your frustration because that means that there's something here, right? Yeah. But one of the things that I actually am also frustrated with, it's the fact that Republicans will promise the moon to a lot of people. And let's be honest, they promise a lot, particularly to working and poor white people for them yep. only to sell them down the river. And I'm not just talking about these centrist Republicans like a Kevin McCarthy. I'm also yep. talking about the MAGA Republicans that will promise them the moon. But then when it comes time to actually give up the goods, for the people, they're giving it to the corporations. Exactly. And this is why I look at people like Donald Trump and I'm saying, Donald Trump is actually playing all of you because you, you literally have somebody that's buddies with the corporate parasites. That's They got a, they got a, their dude in the office. And my thing is, yeah. it's like, if you are thinking, well, Donald Trump is it, then you must think that Elon Musk is it. Then you <laughs> must think that Bill Gates is it then you must yeah. think that George Soros is it because they're all buddies. It doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican, they all have the same class. And so that's the problem that I look at people who say, oh, well, I'm a vote for Trump. You're voting for somebody that doesn't give a crap about any worker. And yeah. we, we can talk about Donald Trump's racism and everything like that all day, but look how he stiffs workers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And if you're voting a conservative, he is nowhere near your values. Well, and not me as a lefty talking about Donald Trump. He doesn't care oh, about yeah. conservative values either. Well, the thing is, and what's weird about this election is this could be a runaway for him. It, well, it could have been, I think it's really close now. All he had to do, cause they tried to put a bullet in his head. Someone did. I don't know who. Someone tried to put a bullet in his head. All he had to do was come out at the RNC convention instead of the hour and a half long rambling speech he did. All he had to do was come out and say, I forgive this kid. We can't live in a country where this kind of thing could happen. And this is how we're going to move forward. 
That's all he had to do. He could have done a half hour speech and just said, this is the path forward so that we don't let this happen again. We can't live in a country where this happens. That's all he had to do. That was it. That was it. And even J.D. Vance, I'm not a fan of J.D. Vance, but the other day he did an interview and he, he was talking about abortion and he was saying, in order, if you don't like abortion, he's personally pro-life, whatever, but he was saying, if you don't like abortion, we should support policies that entice people to have families. And he talked about reinstating the child tax credit. Why don't they, why don't they run on that? Just run on something popular like that and actually do it. And instead they want to do the, do the back and forth. They're calling her a communist now or Kamala a communist now. They're saying that she's a San Francisco liberal, blah, 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 whatever. She's a million miles away from a communist. It's ridiculous. The, the, the level to which they think that the voters and actually the voters probably are that uninformed, <laughs> but the, the amount of degradation in our political discourse, the, the amount of degradation in um, voters understanding of what's really happening is, is sad to see. It really is. Yep. So I, we just need to get the word out there and get people to start to understand that we have two right wing parties they yep. differ only in that they on the, on social issues that at the end of the day, don't pay your rent and don't put food on your table. They're not arguing over any issue that's going to fiscally help or hurt anyone. And as a matter of fact, both parties will do the same things that will screw us over because everything that screws us the hardest is bipartisan at the end of the day. Yep. So, Absolutely. so one of the things <laughs> I want to do is I want to go over your uh, this is your website. So I want to go yep. over your policy yep. positions. Um, so you give pretty much a overview of your history. Um, and you're running uh, in the fourth district. Uh, so let's go to the issues page because I will, you know, it's just like what my friend Afini says. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, she said policy is my love language. So let's go over it. Uh, so first off, uh, you have the one that says in government corruption. So one thing I really like is that you actually share uh, a video, but let me read this paragraph first so that people can get an overview. It says it is estimated that the 2024 election across the U S will cost $10 billion. Who is paying for that? And what are they buying with that money? Citizens United and speechnow.org versus FEC were decided in 2010 and they equated money to speech and uncapped donation limits. It allows unlimited campaign spending through political action committees that can speak louder than our own citizens. Party leadership is decided not by leadership capability, but by fundraising capability. Party leaders bundle money and disperse it to members to control them. If you don't fall in line, we'll just run someone against you. This is true in both parties. Politicians in D.C. spend more time fundraising than governing. This has to end and is why we need independent representatives. And then you give this video about legalized bribery. Um, this was a brilliant breakdown, very easily digestible breakdown of it. Um, so. It basically yeah, I wish I could take credit for that video. That video was actually. Um the award winner for submissions this year that were, um, God, I wish I could remember the Twitter handle, but they are essentially a citizen citizens United Twitter handle. Um, Oh, now it's going to bug me that I can't remember their name. And I, I wish I could give credit where it is due, but that was, yeah. that was the winner for the video this year on uh, citizens United and speech Wow. Let, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to play it actually. Yeah, please. Yeah, I love that video. Yeah. So you want to bribe a U.S. politician. Sorry, that's against the rules. So let's break the rules. And if we're going to break the rules, you need to know them. Bribery of a politician is illegal, or at least our legal system thinks it should be. There's three major court decisions that built up to the loophole we're going to use. Because a mistake was made along the way that legalized the bribery of any U.S. politician. Now, in a perfect crime-ridden world, we could just give money directly to politicians in exchange for something. Quid pro quo. 
but our first court decision in 1976 prevents that. Buckley v. Vallejo. The Supreme Court rules that it is constitutional to limit donations to political campaigns. Because if you can't give $100,000 to a candidate and you're limited to something like $3,000, that makes it very unlikely the candidate will do something for you. We've got senators accepting gold bars out here. Good luck bribing someone for $3,000. The limit also applies to political action committees, PACs, which take donations, then give the money to candidates. You, as of right now, can only donate $5,000 to a PAC per election cycle. But you're a millionaire, and you're looking to bribe someone. So 5K is just not gonna cut it. 2010, Citizens United versus the FEC. The Supreme Court rules that as long as a corporation doesn't coordinate with candidates, there's no possibility of them corrupting candidates. That limiting the spending of a corporation to advocate for or against any political candidate is an infringement on free speech. The free speech of the corporation, of course. This overruled the 1990 Supreme Court decision that said it was constitutional to limit corporations' spending on elections, because if corporations could spend as much as they want to promote candidates, it would distort the political process. That's what the old one said. Thank God we fixed that, right? So now, corporations can spend as much as they like to help out a politician's campaign as long as they're not coordinating. But you want to bribe a politician and you still can't donate any more than $5,000 to a PAC. Those limits are still there. So we need our third court case, speechnow.org versus the FEC. Also in 2010, almost immediately after Citizens United, with Citizens United ruling that independent expenditures by corporations have no risk of corrupting an election, then neither do donations to those corporations. That's the logic. This is where the mistake was made. And if your donation has no risk of corruption, no risk of quid pro quo, then Buckley doesn't apply anymore. It's unconstitutional to stop you from donating as much money as you want to a corporation. And it's unconstitutional to stop a corporation from spending that money on their own. Important note, this wasn't a Supreme Court ruling. It never reached the Supreme Court because the Attorney General didn't think it would be important. So, if you set up a political action committee, but it doesn't coordinate with any campaign, any candidate, people can donate as much as they want. Those PACs are called Super PACs. Try to pause here and figure out how you'd bribe a politician with these two. So, before I continue, one of the things I wanted to say as well is imagine how many of these billionaires have funneled this money through these super PACs that they own. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine, uh, for instance, an Elon Musk or Harlan Crow or a Charles Koch that continuously funnels money. Now, we already know that Charles, uh, I'm sorry, Harlan Crow. Uh, is very generous with his money when it comes to Supreme Court justices. So imagine what he's doing to congressional members, as well as anybody who may be running at state level, as well as municipally. You have all these different types of people that are donating millions of dollars in order to control a lot of these politicians. And quiet as this is kept, it's actually not that much that some of these politicians are actually doing yeah, favors for these people. Exactly. Maybe like two, three, four thousand dollars, and you're doing a, a favor for them. And I'm like, wait, what? You're gonna do this political favor for this billionaire for only 30 racks? Are you kidding me right now? That's all it yeah. takes. Like, I mean, if you're gonna be, you know, if you're gonna sell yourself at least, <laughs> you know, do it for a higher amount. It's well, crazy. And what people don't understand and what, what really peeves me, <laughs> what really makes me angry is people don't understand. This is not donation out of the kindness of their heart. It is not, no. it is. And the video talks about it. You can't make an in-kind donation. You can't have a quid pro quo, but this is not just because they want a Republican in there. It's because they want a vote. That's going to give them easier regulations. It's going to lower their taxes. It's an investment and they expect a return from that investment and people don't understand that. And then they get an email from a candidate who says, oh, well, you just chip in 20 bucks or whatever. Well, you know what? As it turns out, that 20 bucks isn't going to get you anything as just a normal Joe who maybe needs that 20 bucks to get dinner. You know what I mean? It's and people still fall for it. 
And yeah. they talked about when Kamala, as soon as Kamala announced, she had the the donation rake in of 81 million or whatever the, that first day haul was. That's a stupid amount of money. That is a yeah. stupid amount of money. And especially when the Democrats, well, actually both, they get free advertising on TV. They were talking about the 2016 cycle was like a billion dollars in free advertising for Trump. It's free. It's free to them in the major parties. Free. Yeah. And they're just yep. hauling in normal working people's money. Bernie, the fraud lawsuit where the DNC was just like, well, we'd, we'll do whatever we want. It, it's disgusting that people still think that giving to a politician is going to help them in some way. Yep, absolutely. Let's finish up the video and we'll continue with the policies. Tools, because now it's easy. All you need to do is promise that politician you'll donate $100,000, maybe a million just not to them. You'll donate it to the super PAC that's running ads to advocate for them. All they have to do in exchange is give you a favor once they're elected. You know, something for something. And because the courts have declared that this could never, ever possibly cause corruption, you're in the clear. That is how our elections function and have been since 2010. Now to any normal person, that's a clear mistake. Because that's corruption, what we've been doing is corruption. It's bribery. It's what the law intends to prevent. There's no functional difference if the money you donate is going to a PAC or to the campaign. As long as it helps the candidate, you can use that to influence them. Quid pro quo. It's a clear oversight. This is why most of the spending on modern campaigns doesn't come from the campaigns anymore. It comes from super PACs. Super PACs funded by the rich to buy politicians. The solution is putting those donation limits back, and they can be, once the Supreme Court overrules the court that declared these limits unconstitutional. But until that mistake is fixed, this is your up-to-date guide on how to bribe a politician. So basically, that is the uh, video. Just want to give a you know huge thank you for that, uh, for sharing that part uh so that people know like how this works because a lot of people just yeah. don't know um but one of the things i do want to share is continuing on uh in this was uh so here you have single issue bills it says this is one of the policy positions that you have it says one of the most mm -hmm. nefarious ways that politicians pull the wool over voters eyes is voting on bills that are packed together must pass legislation is full of pork. They're designed legislation to allow each yes vote to get something that they can go home and brag about while holding their nose on the issue at hand. Aside from the budget, each issue vote should be clean up or down. They even skirt the budget by continuing resolutions that are packed with pork. So um, this reminds me of the 94 crime bill and Bernie Sanders reluctantly voted for it because it had the Violence Against Women Act in it. Yeah. And uh, this is a perfect example of having a bill that you don't like, but it has something good in it. So you vote for something, even though you don't like it, it has something good that you want to pass in it. And now Bernie Sanders gets attacked for voting for the crime, for the crime bill, even though the only reason why he did was because of the Violence Against Women Act in it. That's how they get you. And um, I saw, I can't remember the name of the bill, but it, they always give them the, these catchy names like the Save Middle Class America, blah, 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 whatever bill. Aaron Bean, I saw a, a floor speech that he gave about that bill, talking about how it was going to help America's middle class and all of these wonderful things it was going to do. So I, I decided I'd read the bill because I, I know how to look it up on the interwebs and read a bill. So I decided to read through it. And it's got a couple of things that would have helped the middle class, but at least a third of the text in that bill was given tax breaks to Taiwan and Taiwan or Taiwanese owned businesses in the United States. A third of that bill for helping America's middle class was giving tax breaks to Taiwan somehow. And he didn't mention that in his floor speech. That's really weird that they just squeezed that in there and called the bill not that, <laughs> but they do that all the time. You just have to take the time and read the bills. And the, that's the other thing about this guy. So I had a conversation uh, last week with one of his friends 
But, and when I talked to him, he was like, I'm a friend of Aaron. I'm probably going to vote for Aaron, but let me give you some inside scoop. Well, he went up to DC on vacation. He got the, he got the congressional tour and he was allowed to go into Aaron Bean's office. Aaron wasn't there, but his staffers were there and they explained nicely. This is the desk where Aaron sits. And they pointed at his whip board, you know, what a whip board is right where the, where the votes are falling out. Mm -hmm. pointed at his whip board and said, this is where he sits. And that's the board he looks at to see how he's going to vote. And they, he was like, does he read anything that he's really voting for? And they were like, no, not really. (laughs) That's crazy. And how many people, how many Congress people have that same system? They're like, I'm just going to vote on the party line. And they don't read what they're, what they're preaching. It, that blew my mind. And I was like, this guy says he's a friend of his and he's going to tell me that <laughs> it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind that he said that, but it's, that's what happens. They're yes men. Yeah. That's basically what they are. Yeah. They're just holding the door open for the parasites to, to run roughshod in government. Exactly. Like, what in the world are you a Senator? Or a congressperson, and you don't read the bills, and this is why you have these six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred page bills, and yeah. they don't read it; they just vote according to party lines without actually reading the bill. Exactly. Oh and my gosh, the rot, the rot is just so it's sky high. Yeah. So exactly. uh, you talk about stopping the DC revolving doors. So here you're actually talking about how. Um, many people who are in D.C., once they get out of office, they're in different uh, boards, they're in lobbying positions, paid contributors. Like, for instance, uh, I, I, I'm fr- blanking on her name, but she uh, she lost her seat in Missouri. And then Claire she, McCaskill. Yeah, Claire McCaskill. Thank you. Yeah. Claire McCaskill lost her seat and then she was able to get a spot as a contributor on MSNBC. To tell Democrats how to win after she lost her ass. <laughs> right. Right. That's like, that's like, wait, hold up. Let, let, let me, so y'all can see my face. That's like Juan Guaido being oh. hired to sh- tell people how to win an election. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't win. <laughs> Moving on, so basically stopping that revolving door, which is a great uh, policy, and then accountability to voters, not donors. You say that you will never take PAC money, and you're running for the people of the district. So you basically said, if you ever break the pledge, to just fire you. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I'm retired Navy, and I'm 100% disabled. My bills are paid. I, I don't need. I don't need the money. You know what I mean? I, and I don't understand why you would join government to get rich. That's just, it's disgusting. You shouldn't go in there, normal middle class and come out a millionaire. That's what kind of government is that? What kind of government is that? So Mm -hmm. I'm, and as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you know how much they get paid. They get paid like 15 grand a month. That's 175 grand a year to be in Congress. And I don't need that money. I'm going to donate that money. Anything I don't, well, obviously I'm going to have to live in DC. So that'll be a few thousand, but the rest of it, I'm going to give away. I don't need that money. I don't need it. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, people who go up there just to get rich is, uh, that's the worst kind of politician you could ever have. Yeah. Well, that's why they're in politics because so they can get rich. basically. (laughs) Exactly. So let's continue on. I would like to go to this next uh, policy position. Uh, so after in government corruption, you talk about protecting free speech. Uh, oh, and have, real quick sorry, on the, before we leave corruption, I, mm-hmm. I have a note in there. We have to address that before we can have a conversation about any of these others. We mm-hmm. have to. I mean, it, is it on there? Well, oh uh, yeah, there no. you go. Every every other issue I have on this page means nothing if we don't end the corruption. Yeah, because we can't have an honor, honest conversation about any real policy until we get the money out of politics. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah, 
I like on the last part, you said we need to ensure that the $1.2 million that Aaron B has quote unquote raised this cycle doesn't get one more vote in the house. And then you exactly. link the open secrets. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of people don't uh, know that exists. They don't even know that they can look that up. Oh yeah. And, and here's the thing. I reference open secrets all the time on this channel. Uh, you know, we talk about, because the thing is a lot of people don't know who their politicians are really paid for. If mm -hmm. the person who pays you the most is the person you're employed by. Exactly. And if exactly. you're not the ones paying them the most, then they're employed by somebody else. All right. So let's go on to protect free speech. Uh, then you talk about free speech. Uh, one of the things that you talked about was, uh, you know, what they did against Julian Assange, which uh, also is, you know, um, something that I think that people need to uh, think about when it comes to press freedom. So I really appreciate you talking about Julian Assange. You also talked about um, uh, Gonzalo Lira, as well as um, you talked about Gonzalo Lira, and I think you talked about somebody else. Um, oh, you talked about the people who were actually protesting Cop City and oh, yeah. Yeah. people who yeah. got RICO charges, too. And that was the same grand jury that indicted Trump, the exact same one. Yeah. I mean, and, and people people think that those are separate issues. That's the same thing. That's that's the same thing. <clears throat> now, uh, just a question about have you heard about the recent indictments against uh, people like Chairman O'Malley Shatella of the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, him, yes. Jesse Hubble and Penny Hess. Um, they're also being indicted against for conspiring with the with Russian Russia. government, even though that is a bunch of baloney. They that's never ridiculous. conspired with the Russian government. Yeah, that's ridiculous. But the thing is, and this is what I'm truly, truly scared of, is now that now they've got rules in the books where they can just say you're a domestic terrorist and they can throw you away, throw away the key, just just lock you up. And I looking at uh, I don't you obviously follow all the union things. You know that Sean Fain when they did the UAW strike strike and they they negotiated their contract, they said that it was going to expire on May Day, 2028. And you've got other unions out there who are renegotiating their contracts, getting an expiration date on May Day, 2028. Well, that's four years away. And on the path we're on, is a general strike going to be even legal in four years? Right? Because now we can't even protest our government. Now we can't even go out and protest. They're, they're arresting kids on the college campuses for, for the pro-Palestine protests. They are, they are doing all of these things to try and make striking as impossible as they can. In four years, can we have a general strike? Is that is that putting the putting the goalpost too far out there? I mean, and I hate to sound all conspiracy or whatever, but that's the it feels like that's the path that we're going on, and that is scary as hell. And people should be frightened of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and people like Ron DeSantis, who uh, is really anti free speech, I don't care what people say. If you're oh, yeah. trying to limit the amount of what, what people can uh, practice their First Amendment rights in the streets, then you're anti-free speech. And that's what people like Ron DeSantis is doing yeah. as well. And a lot of people and, don't realize that, you know, and, and, they'll, and he'll try to tag it to, oh, the woke mob. We got to control the woke mob. Thing is, the minute you start to control the woke, woke mob, guess what? Your speech is also being controlled, too. Exactly. And the thing that people don't understand, and I've, I've had so many arguments with people over this because I am, I'm pro Palestine. We need to end the genocide. It is a genocide. And I would, I would come out and say things like that. And, and I would come out in support of the protesters and say, we shouldn't be arresting them. And then people would come at me and I'd tell them we need, we need to protect the speech that we don't like the most, the most. Because I, I took an oath to the Constitution. I, I did it several times when I was in the Navy. And I believe in the Constitution. And if we cannot stand up and protest our government anymore, if they make that illegal, mm -hmm. then 
what are they going to do next? And what's going to happen when the government gets so far gone that in our police state, which it is a police state, Mm -hmm. we can't do anything about it. Now our constitution is just ripped to shreds and that's scary. So whether you agree with the kids on, on the college campuses or not, you should be fighting like hell to make sure that they can go out there and protest. Because what happens when the government comes to take your guns? You're going to protest. You're going to, are you going to protest? Are you, are you maybe going to have an issue with that? But they don't see that there is a, a conflation between those two things. So well, I mean, when it comes to free speech, uh, look, I just talked about the report on how they're actually trying to uh, go over the material in college campuses that to them are anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, right? It could be a question and it could be the wrong answer to a question. Like one of the questions was, uh, Israel is the source of terrorism. Well, we know that that's not true, but the problem is, is that just the question being asked, even if it's a wrong answer, is considered anti-Semitic. And I'm like, wait a minute, why are we taking our cues from a foreign government? Because if we were to say, oh, well, the source of terrorism is Iran, would that have gotten as much pushback from the government, from the floor, from, from yeah. Tallahassee? Yeah. And so I mean, the thing is, is, like, I feel like, you know, uh, when people talk about, oh, we have to defend Israel, and I'm just like, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, Israelis aren't the only demographic that live in this country that, yeah. you know, people... You know, what about the Chinese? What about the people from, what about the Palestinians <laughs> who live in this country? Exactly. You know, what about the people from France? Are we going to be, you know, fighting on behalf of France? Are we going to be fighting on behalf of Italy? You know, what What about Venezuela? So yeah. my thing is, it's like, you know, is we're always, you know, uh, it's like, are you America first? Are you Florida first? Yeah. I mean, and people, people, like I said, the way that we are brainwashed into our, into our little neat boxes that we all fit in apparently. And there's only two boxes. <laughs> We're brainwashed into not having a discussion about these things. I can, I, I can't go and talk to someone and express my true opinion and expect to have a normal conversation if they don't agree with me. They're just going to say, yeah. well, you, you're a Trump supporter or you're, you're a, you're a communist or you're whatever, wh- whichever side they're on. If I disagree with them, our, our discourse is just, so it sets you up to be angry. It sets you up to be, is that feedback on my end? I'm sorry. Did you hear that feedback? No. Okay. Um, but it, it is, it sets you up to be argumentative it, and it sets you up to be on your team and, and you can't consider any other options. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's move on. I want to talk about, so I, even though you are a veteran, I really appreciate that you said reduce defense spending. Uh, so you talk about how Afghan and a war in Iraq cost us $1.79 trillion and it's estimated to reach $2.89 trillion, which including veteran medical and disability care in 2050. So, and you talk about, you know, we have over 800 military bases around the world. Um, we are sending our poor and middle-class youth overseas to kill poor and middle-class youth there for military industrial complex profit. I love that you say everything as bluntly and plainly here. This is the reason why we have wars, because it is a for-profit business. And I appreciate you putting this out there. Well, anyone who says protect our troops that doesn't follow that immediately up with then bring them home, then why are they sitting? The two that we just lost from South, South Georgia, um, they're just up the road from me. The two that were lost in Jordan. Why are, why are we in Jordan? Why are we there? Why do we have a base there? And it's, it's because we're protecting the oil fields in Syria because we need to cripple that country for whatever reason so that we can take their oil. And those two kids, they were sent home in caskets. They flew into Jacksonville and they did a procession going all the way up to Georgia because they're, they're from Waycross, I believe. But they went through my district driving them in caskets and boxes home because they were killed 
because we're trying to steal oil from another country. And there were people lined up on the streets thinking it was all patriotic, that they, these were heroes. That's, that's sad. That's just sad that that's where we are because people don't understand why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, now, as a veteran, I, I want to ask you this because I don't want to be disrespectful. But in my view, it feels like these young people that are going to fight abroad, they're more, they're much less heroes. They are more victims. Yeah. And for, for the system. Um, am I wrong for saying that? I, I think it's true. And I, I will tell you when I joined, I joined, um, just because it was, I got into the nuclear power program and I was like, I get to go and run a reactor, which was totally awesome. And I was on submarines. I loved it. I absolutely loved mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And I was on submarines. So I was never in the desert. I never had to, I never had to kill anybody. Thank God. But the people, when I come home and I'm, I'm standing next to a Marine who were, really was in the, in the mess. And people look at the two of us and say, thank you for your service. It, to me, that's not, don't thank me. Don't, th because it's not done. Because like, like I said at the very beginning of this, the country that I thought I was serving is not here. It's not here. Mm -hmm. It's an idealistic version of a country that we are sold so that we go and play military. So that we don't turn into that shithole country. When we come home, we realize that it, it is a shithole country and that they don't take care of us when we get home. Um, and again, I, I wasn't in the worst of it, but the people that I've met who have been, they are treated horribly and they are messed up for the rest of their lives. And there's no giving that back to someone. There's no giving that back. So I sorry, go ahead. No, I, I reference in my head the uh, uh, quote from a member of the Orlando chapter for RBN. So we do mutual aid here in Orlando. But one of the Jacksonville mutual... chapter, by the way. Hmm? You need a Jacksonville chapter, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> but one of the things that she said, because she's a physician with the VA, she said that the VA is actually on a hiring freeze. And in that hiring freeze, a lot of their medical personnel is actually being overworked right now because there's a hiring freeze, because they don't have enough personnel to be able to take care of our veterans. And our, the way our veterans are being treated right now is uh, they're, they're basically throwaways because you're, you're treating people who don't go out into the battlefield who are owners of the Raytheons and the Lockheed Martins and the Northrop Grumman's, you're treating them better than you treat your own, your own people who actually fought for the country. And I think that's absolutely horrid. And the fact is, is that it's because, you know, the people who are part of the military industrial complex actually own our government. It's just sad. Yeah. And we're just pawns in their game. And why can't, why can't we take that money and say, you know what? Because being in the military, the best deal we get is we get the VA loan, which is a zero down payment mortgage, right? So we get the VA loan and we get the GI bill so we can go to college. Why can't we say, instead of joining the military, and I, I've heard Jose talk about this too, instead of joining the military, why don't we have a civil service where you can learn a skill, like a skill building things here, build a community here, and we will give you the same benefits as if you were in the military, we're going to give you a VA loan. We won't call it VA. We'll call it some civil service loan or whatever. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll allow you to go to college. People want cheaper housing. People want free college work for the country, civil service. Why can't we have that? Why, why do we spend over a trillion dollars a year exporting death and destruction? And we have no money to spend here. And like I said, the, my hometown, it's a stop on the interstate. It's, it's gone to complete crap because the factories moved out because NAFTA and everyone in that town, everyone was lifted up by the factory. All of the small businesses were lifted up because there was, because there was just money in the town. Does that make sense? It was just every, everything was better. Not everyone had to be in a union, but since we had it there, everyone was lifted up. Yeah. Why can't we, why can't we do that? Why don't we think that way anymore? Why do we, why do we worship corporations that are just, I mean, it's, 
it's slavery. It's I, Richard Wolf, um, his his interview last week with Jim Dior. I watch Richard Wolf all the time, but that interview where he was talking about how we've gone from slavery to feudalism to capitalism, and capitalism is really just neo feudalism because we have the billionaire club that we have to worship and we have to join our house and, and raise our flags or whatever for the billionaire that we're, that we're backing. And at the end of the day, they're not going to do anything for us. We're just, yeah. Yeah. we're just team Elon or we're team Trump or we're team. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's yeah. the exact same place. We're in the same place. We've gone a thousand years and we're in the same place again. <laughs> Basically let's move on to the next one that I wanted to get to. Uh, so diplomatic foreign policy solutions. So you talk about the fall of the dollar, particularly the petrodollar since the 1970s. Yep. Uh, and now we are, for all intents and purposes, entering into a multipolar world. You have BRICS, which stands for uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But now there are other nations that have joined in. I actually I think reported on 13 this. now. Yeah, 13. So that's why I call it BRICS Plus now. But yes. Uh, the only one that became a part but then uh, pulled out was Argentina because of the election of Javier Mele. Uh, of course, that was, in my opinion, idiotic because now look at Argentina. Argentina is going in shambles now because of Javier Mele's uh, austerity policies. But this is how you, this, you talk about um, talk about the U.S. dominance. Uh, and so one of the questions that I have in regards to this particular point that you talk about, about foreign policy solutions is, uh, can you talk about the routes that could be taken to not be isolated in a multipolar world? Well, the first thing we need to do is stop using sanctions as a tool of war. Um, stop using sanctions with the intent of regime change. Stop using sanctions because when we do sanctions, like the people in Russia, it's the people who are suffering because of all of our sanctions. It's not, it's not Vladimir Putin. It's the people of Russia or it's the people of Iran, just the, just the normal people. And they know that the United States is doing that. They know who to hate. We're just making enemies out of, millions of people by by using sanctions in order to yeah. affect some diplomatic change mm -hmm. and the cia calls it blowback right you do something and that's gonna that's gonna cause more terrorists or it's gonna cause more people who hate america whatever but it's blowback we're and we're seeing it because of the sanctions that we're doing and we're doing them so haphazardly and we're not doing them in a way that would again, truly punish the person or the group of people that we think that we're punishing. It's, it's punishing people at the bottom and it's, and it's yeah. making us, even if, even if we got back to the point where the U S dollar was dominant again, we would still have the same problems because we are making enemies everywhere because we've weaponized the dollar. That's why BRICS is coming about is because we weaponized the dollar and they were like, you know what, let's do something different because now they're outside of what we can do with sanctions. That's the whole reason that happened. We did it to ourselves. So yeah, there's better well, ways. Uh, <laughs> well, so, so you actually make a great point and um, I want to give a direction attention to this because you talk about um, how tariffs uh, hurt American consumers. You talk about regime change wars, but I want to focus on the immigration crisis because we are in Florida. And of yeah. course, people like Ron DeSantis will talk about, well, they're coming to, they're, they're, we have this huge invasion coming on. They'll fear monger about immigrants. And you talk about these sanctions. And just this paragraph actually really just hits home the actual underlying cause. So I'll read it here. It says, the refugees who are flooding our borders are often coming from countries that we have destabilized. Being angry at immigrants instead of the system that created the problem is narrow-sighted. Additionally, neither party wants to fix the border since their donors benefit from cheap, undocumented labor and it helps suppress wages for all Americans. 
Note that the border crossings really ramp up during the summer of labor, just as Americans were standing up and demanding to be treated and paid fairly post COVID. It is interesting timing. So one of the things that I really applaud, because a lot of times, like you talk about how the CIA calls it the blowback. Somebody benefits from that blowback. Yeah. And it's the corporations. They benefit from the blowback immensely because when you sanction Venezuela, and this was talked about mm -hmm. uh, on one of Sabi Sab's uh, voter panels, I think two weeks ago. When yeah. you sanction the hell out of Venezuela, it causes their public policy to diminish so that people end up feeling like, well, I'm not being taken care of. I have to go abroad. So they will travel to their danger to the United States and become undocumented immigrants because of the sanctions that are happening in Venezuela. Yep. And as we ramp up sanctions in these countries, then these people actually come here. Because like someone said, I think it was Shahid Bolson. I think it was him. It might be somebody else. But they said it is better to be behind the barrel of the gun to be in front of it. Yeah. Because even though they know, they know that they're going to be persecuted here, it's better to be persecuted inside the empire instead of being persecuted outside the empire. Absolutely. So if you can speak to that a little bit, sir. Well, there is there is vitriol against normal people who just want a better life coming into this country instead of propping up their countries and helping their countries however their election turns out however because it's none of our damn business it's just it's not whatever happened in venezuela is what happened in venezuela mm -hmm. right we should be supporting them because they're in our hemisphere they're our neighbors they have resources that we may want we have resources that they may want we may produce things that they want. Why are we not working with our neighbors? And if we just if we just helped them to to whatever extent we can, or just stop hurting them, they could stay at home, and then we wouldn't have this immigration crisis or whatever whatever you want to call it. We're we're doing it to ourselves, and and um, instead of righteous indignation at the people who are putting us in that position people have righteous indignation against the people coming across the border who are just trying to do better for their lives better for their families they want to come here and they can so that they can work so that they can send a check home because they're not coming here as whole families in a lot of cases it's someone who's going to come here and work and send a check home so that's mm -hmm. taken that's taken money from here and sending it away because of our actions Does that makes sense i mean it's just we're pissed at the wrong people. We're, we're mad at the wrong people. Absolutely couldn't be more wrong at, uh, at what we're doing. But then the same thing happens. And this is the other trip up that, that Trump did saying that the immigrants are coming and taking black jobs and every, everyone, all the Democrats were like, I'm just going, just going to my black job, not understanding that the immigrants come to lower wage communities and those lower wage communities are typically black and brown communities and they are affecting those countries more. That's what he was trying to say. Well, maybe that's given him a lot of credit to say that's what he was trying to say, but that's, a, that's essentially what's happening. And it's, it's hurting our, our working class, our poor, our working poor more than it's hurting anyone at the top. So, yeah. And then you're just supposed to hate your neighbor all of a sudden. It, yeah. It's not helping us. And it's and we're angry at the wrong people. Simple as that. Yeah. One of the things I, I also had a, a question in regards to the immigration crisis. Uh, you speak <laughs> about the real source of this uh, crisis. What would you do to ensure in the meantime that workers aren't undercut by employers exploiting undocumented immigrants? I wish there was an easy solution for that. I truly, truly do. Um, because I don't want to be the person who says, if you've, if you've come all of this way and you have a job and you're undocumented, we should just kick you out. I don't, you have to have some humanity in it. You do. 
Yeah, I agree. For right now, we need to shut down the border to, to whatever extent that we can. We need immigration. We're an immigrant country. But we need to shut it down to the extent that we can until we can wrap our heads around what's really going on and how many are actually here that we need to have a process for, whether that is a process to get them back home or whether it's a process to get them to citizenship. We need to lock it down, get a good count, and figure out our path forward. Because we have to have a path forward instead of just a path that is arguing that that one side is racist and the other side is super friendly when they both have kids in cages. That's not a, not a beneficial argument, but at the same time, and you could look back to the nineties, you can look at the left. The proper left was against open borders too, right? You can look back at Bernie Sanders speeches where he was saying this hurts working Americans. We need to lock it down. And now you have a, a complete flip in which side says that immigration is bad. When, mm -hmm. when stopping an immigration or controlling immigration to a much higher extent is actually a leftist position. It really is. Mm -hmm. And we need to take back the narrative on that. We have to. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, I'm heartened to think about is the fact that if you really wanted to slow the people who are uh, coming here under duress, because that's yeah. what these people are coming here. It's, it's not, it's not, they're just, doing it, you know, pardon me for saying this, but they're not coming here for shits and giggles, right? Yeah. They're coming here because they're suffering in their own country due to what we're doing over there. And if you really want to slow that stream, then you have to nip it in the butt at the source, meaning yeah. stop it in sanctions, stop trying to undermine their elections and things like that. But stop the CIA from back in their drug cartels, maybe? Well, that, I mean, that <laughs> would also be a great solution too. But, uh, and... and one of my biggest issues is, is that a lot of times, uh, a lot of the undocumented immigrants, and I think, and, and I blame the people, the corporate parasites at the top for this. A lot of people who are under duress, under no fault of their own, will come here undocumented. And then they will get treated slightly better than the rest of us who are yeah. poor and working poor. And then that creates a rift between the poor and working poor, particularly a lot of black communities right now, are actually upset at immigrants or really they're not set upset at immigrants, but they're upset at the immigration crisis. Well, they're trying to, they're trying to recall the mayor in Chicago right now for this exact reason, because yeah. people are saying you're going to, you're going to put them up in hotels. You're going to give them credit cards. And what, the, what have you done for us? Yeah. Where's our little, where's our little bit? Yeah. And my thing is, is like, if we're going to shut things down, which I can't say whether I'm for or against because I feel like I I don't want to shut it down until we actually stop what we're doing there. But at the same time, it needs to be shut down because I want the American people to fare better. But with that being said, then it's would you be for pushing for legislation that gives equal benefits to anybody who comes within the country. Okay, if we're going to start giving strollers to families who are coming across the border, all right, everybody else who's poor, we start giving strollers to them too. Or if we're giving uh, a $400 a month, you know, credit card, not credit card, but debit card to somebody who came here, yeah. then anybody who is, you know, poor and working class in this country, no matter who they are, they're also going to get the same thing. Like everybody gets a, a base, you know, of, of support, not just people who are coming here undocumented, but also people who have been here uh, for people like people like my family that's been here since the 16 and 1700s. Yeah. I mean, we, we can't, um, like I said, that's why they're recalling the mayor in Chicago is, is because of that, uh, dissonance between the, the two groups. And that's, that's causing people to hate each other. It's yeah. causing an unfair balance. It, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I wish there was a perfect solution. I really do. Me too. But that, you know, it, it, it it's, it's kind of hairy either way you go, but I want to quickly move on to the next uh, portion. 
Thank you very much for being very deeply honest about that one. You talk about fair minimum wage. Uh, so this one has been, this is pretty much self-explanatory, but you talk about the cost of living increase for social security and BAH, which is military basic allowance for housing. And you said, well, why don't we do the same thing for just wages, period? Exactly. Exactly. You know, have a cost <laughs> of living adjustment. Um, so uh, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, uh, the wages in Florida, in, the wage in Florida you need to afford a two bedroom apartment is actually $35 an hour. I reported recently on how auto repossessions are on the rise, which is a huge indication of more people struggling. So, you know, it's and then in 2023 last year, I think it was January 2023 last year, homelessness rose 12 percent. Uh, so can you speak to that phenomenon that's happening in your district? Well, like I like I said earlier, um, we've got we've got kids who grow up here and can't afford to live here. I I go to I go to like the local store and I'll I'll say, hey, by the way, I'm running for Congress. And they're like, oh, well, I only work here. I, I actually live in Georgia because it's too expensive to live here. That that is more common than it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and for that minimum wage, like I said, BAH and anyone who's not military probably doesn't understand, but every year BAH is calculated based on which base you're near, right? So kind of down to the zip code on what your BAH is going to be. And that's your basic allowance for housing. And it's adjusted a percent or a couple of percent every year. And it's, it's always moving. Right. So that's why I was saying, instead of just passing a number today, but what, what happens if we go another 16 years, 15, 16 years without raising the minimum wage again, mm -hmm. why don't we just put into the, into writing, we're going to make an adjustment every year. And the numbers for BAH, those actually, you start getting paid January 1st, but the numbers for what BAH is going to increase to come out in October when they do the calculations, it's the same for mm -hmm. social security income. So yeah. any small business who's employing someone, they're going to know in mid October, what their, what the new minimum uh, wage is going to be on January 1st, they can make adjustments as they need to make adjustments. And once you've got that in place, then it doesn't have to be because now I, I just had a lady who owns a small business, uh, got in an argument with her because she was saying, well, we can't go from seven twenty five an hour to $20 an hour. And I was like, well, that's cause we haven't done anything in 16 years. That may be, Maybe if we had been consistently moving, moving the, moving the line, then it wouldn't be such a shock right now. And she was like, well, it's going to put small businesses out of business. Well, if you can't pay a living wage, then maybe you shouldn't run a business. I'm sorry. I, I hate to say that, but maybe, maybe you're on the wrong, wrong line of work. Um, and you shouldn't be hiring people that you can't pay. So, and the other thing is, I think it's, um, somewhere between 10 and 15%. And then the number is probably higher because there's gig work out there that isn't reported the same, but somewhere between 10 and 15% of people have to have two jobs to survive. Mm -hmm. And that is granted. It's a small percentage, 10 or 15%, but that's millions of people, millions of people who the only way that they can put food on the table and a roof over their head is to have a second job. One of them probably full-time with crap benefits and the other one part-time or two part-time jobs with absolutely no benefits that that's unsustainable. We can't keep doing this to our people and expect that we're not at some point going to end up with, with pitchforks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's horrible because I think a lot of people really need to, to see how, uh, you know, people will say, well, we can't afford it now at a minimum wage. If minimum wage goes up, prices have went up before while the minimum wage is still the same as it is. Well, if you look at what they just did in California, they went to, what is it, $20 an hour for fast food workers? Mm -hmm. And prices prices for a meal went up maybe a quarter. So you're all, that's nothing. That's nothing. And everyone was like, well, if you want to pay $20 for a Big Mac, blah, 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 blah. Well, no, that's not, that's actually not what happened. That's not what no. happened at all. Um. But people are still complaining about them getting $20 an hour for fast food workers because they're just fast food workers. Well, as it turns out, if fast food is or fast food workers, the only job you can get, you should be able to live doing that job. 
maybe not be super rich or anything, but you should be able to live. Yeah. Yeah. Have the basics, right? Yeah. So I want to go into uh, this as well. Uh, you talk about uh, housing affordability. So this is something that's, um, I'll get to healthcare in a second, but I want to jump to housing yeah. affordability because I think Florida. that's really important. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, here in Florida, that housing affordability is 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 its own crisis in itself. But uh, you know, you talk about housing affordability, um, making housing affordability better. You know, especially focusing on the minimum wage. Uh, I'll be talking about housing in a little bit when it comes to the uh, housing insurance industry that is really dropping off how, uh, people who own homes. But one of the things that I wanted to also talk about was, again, the National Low Income Housing Coalition actually talked about $35 an hour you need it to, in order to afford a two bedroom apartment. Um, so how would raising the minimum wage help Floridian workers who are already struggling to pay rent? Because the thing is, a lot of times people will say, well, if you raise the minimum wage, then everything else is going to go up. That's just talk to any economist. That's not how it works. Just raising the minimum wage doesn't make everything go up exactly the same amount. It just it does not work that way. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but at the same time, the what I brought up there in housing affordability because I'm a realtor, so I I see what happens. We've got new neighborhoods popping up around here all over the place. And there was a neighborhood, um, Wildlight, uh, or over by Wildlight, which is our new big cool thing. Rayonair was kind enough to give a whole bunch of land uh, so that they could get tax breaks and tax subsidies and all these fancy things when they were like, oh, we'll, we'll cut down some pine trees and let you build a neighborhood. Anyway, but there was a new neighborhood. I talked to one of the site agents there uh, and she said that she had just written a contract for 15 homes, not built yet, 15 homes, and they were going to make them rentals immediately. And that's not, that's not a one-off that happened a lot over the last few years, people coming in and just buying houses cash with the intention of taking a brand new house and turning it immediately into a rental property. And you know why they do that? Do you know why they do that? I can tell you exactly why they do that. It's not for cash flow; It's for that tax write-off. So every house that they buy, there's a tax write-off and I've, I've owned rental properties and I can tell you when I did my taxes every year, every year on paper, I lost money on paper. I lost money, but I still got a tax deduction for every rental property that I had. And I paid lower taxes, even though I was losing money on, on the houses, but I was putting money in my bank account every single month. Does that make sense? Does that really make sense? So what they're doing is they're taking all of that money and they're putting it into oh. rental homes that they can depreciate over a 30 year period of time. And they're using it as a tax haven. All we need to do is get rid of that loophole because that, that depreciation is, it, it used to be in there for like, if you owned a restaurant and you, and you went and bought a fancy oven for your restaurant, it would not be a fancy, nice oven forever. Right. At some point that oven would degrade to the point where you need to buy a new oven. So that oven was a business expense and you could depreciate it over a period of time because it was money you were putting into a business. And it, at some point you would have to replace the oven. So you've depreciated it over that period of time. Does that make sense? So when you do that for a house, a house and the property it's sitting on is an appreciating asset. It's not a depreciating asset. It's not going to be worth $0 in 30 years, but the way that they do that depreciation by using it as like equipment, they are, they are depreciating an appreciating asset and getting a tax benefit out of it. And that needs to go away. That has got to go away. If they want depreciation and anyone who rents knows this for a fact, if you want depreciation, do maintenance on the house. Replace the windows when the windows need to be replaced. Replace the floors, update the kitchen. If you want to do those things and upgrade your investment, then you can write that off. Sure, if you do work to that house, write that off.
but you shouldn't be able to depreciate it and do nothing to it. I can't tell you how many rentals I've gone into where they haven't done any work on it. The, the owners owned it for 10, 15, 20 years. They've never done any work to it. It's just a paycheck to them. And they've been depreciating it the whole time. And the rentals are disgusting, disgusting places, but people need a place to live. So they, that's where they're going to go. So it, it bugs the hell out of me. It, I, it truly, truly does. So we can get rid of that tax loophole. And I think it will help a lot in the short term because they're going to have to get out of those houses. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that loophole definitely should be addressed. Definitely. One of my next questions actually is many people who are making below what it takes to afford a two bedroom uh, apartment in Florida, they're suffering from the corporate price gouging that we've seen over the last two to four years. Would you be in favor of expanding the criteria for renters to receive rental assistance like Section 8 or other federal programs? And if so, would you endorse a statewide rent control measure? Rent controls gets kind of tricky, but I would definitely, I would definitely try and make it more easily, more easy to access uh, Section Eight. And the other thing about that is that working working in a country or a company that has a rental department, when people call and they say, "I finally got my Section Eight voucher after years on a waiting list," in some cases, I got my Section Eight voucher. Do you have any Section Eight housing available? The answer is always, oh, well, we're not allowed to say blah, 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 which means we don't have any. And then why, why do people not accept Section 8? Well, it is, it is the stigma that's been placed on that money. There's a mm -hmm. stigma that says, well, if they're Section 8, that means they're poor. That means they're going to be criminals. I don't want them living in my house, which is horrible because the, the people who are getting Section 8, again, they have to wait years sometimes to get that voucher. That yeah. means that they've been trying to do the right thing for so long before they finally get there. And then when they get there, there's nothing available for them. So we should make it, make it a faster process to be able to get section eight. And we should also have some, some kind of an, a public education about what section eight truly is. And it's not just drug addicts. It's not just criminals. It's not just super ultra poor people. It'll never work. You have to jump through loopholes to get it. And people who are, who are landlords need to understand that these people have put forth the effort to get to that place so that they would be more willing to accept it. And if they go in and section eight and they, they do something wrong, they will lose that forever. You have to understand that they're not going to be the person who's going to come in and trash your house or come in and commit crimes because they will lose that benefit that they have fought for forever. So we yeah. need to get rid of the stigma around it. We need to make yeah. it easier and we need to get rid of the stigma. Yeah. Uh, Finland uh, actually has what they call a housing first model. So this means that you are insured a home. Uh, it, it's not some like big elaborate home. It could just be like an efficiency with a kitchen and a, a room, bathroom, and, you know, just a, you know, basic amenities for people who are unhoused or who are housing insecure, would you be, uh, would you be in favor of, you know, if, if a legislation came to the floor of the house to pass a housing first, that is like what's going on in Finland, you know, so that we can essentially get rid of homelessness. Would you be in favor of that? Absolutely. And actually I'm fairly certain, is it Mississippi or Alabama? One of the two of them has a has has a housing first program, and it's not it's not moving you into the Taj Mahal. But the thing that people don't understand is it's difficult to get into housing um, if you can't get a job. It's difficult to get a job if you don't have an address, right? Catch yeah. twenty two. So the reasoning, be, I I wish I could remember which of the two states it is, but it's one of those that you wouldn't expect would have a housing first platform or a housing first law, but it yeah. essentially it is saying in order to get you on your feet so that you can be a successful, uh, member of society or whatever, however fancy words you want to say it, we are going to make sure that you have a place where you can go and lay your head and where you can get a shower, where you can make your own food, where you can, and that, that works. And they, they've had ridiculous good success with it because it just makes sense. It's just good policy. 
So I have uh, three more questions. And uh, one of the ones I wanted to go to is, and I know I went way over my time, but I really wanted to get these, these questions out as well. But uh, you talk about uh, union support. Oh, first, let me go to healthcare. Uh, this is really pretty much self-explanatory because honestly, it really is a, a, a no-brainer. You talk about how you know you are for a single-payer healthcare system, correct? Absolutely. So this, you know, and, and we have talked about the millions of dollars, the billions of dollars that we would save with a universal healthcare system here in the United States. Uh, I find it interesting that you talk about the insurance uh, companies, health professionals, hospital and nursing homes, and pharmaceuticals also putting money into keeping universal health care out, uh, out of the hands of citizens. Yeah, And yeah. so I appreciate you highlighting this as well. Um, and then you talk about why are businesses opposed to universal health care? Why should businesses embrace universal health care? And I think it is beneficial because it would not only save the country money, it would save the state money and it would save us personally money because you're not spending that money on uh, excessive fees like um, like premiums, deductibles and things like that. So instead, what's your tax like? OK, so if your taxes would go up two hundred and fifty dollars a year, but you're spending two hundred fifty dollars per month on private health insurance, I would rather spend only one month. <laughs> for public health insurance Sorry about that. and still get just as good, if not better coverage, instead of paying $250 a month for an entire year and for them to just deny me, you know, what I exactly. Need. And the other thing is, and the reason that I wanted to put it in there, uh, why businesses are against it, why they think it's a bad thing and why small businesses in particular should be for it. If you, if you are a small business, and you want to you want to hire a dozen people are you mm -hmm. going to be able to get a good health care plan for those dozen people you're not you're going to pay out you're going to pay out the ass for it and yeah. you're not going to be competitive with a big company that has a big block of um medical what i can't remember what they call them uh, but they they negotiate a huge block so they can negotiate a better price than you're going to be as a small business essentially so, bulk pricing yeah. It, yeah. It's like bulk pricing, but yeah. a small business, if, if we had universal healthcare, then a small business doesn't need to worry about how they're going to, how they're going to pick up healthcare for their health, for their workers. And they don't have to try and get the Cadillac program to be competitive with a bigger business that has that Cadillac insurance mm -hmm. system. You know what I'm saying? So a small business should be for it. And it would stop your health care from being tied to your job. You lose your job, you go and get another job, or you decide you want to leave your job and go and get another job. It can be yeah. months before your new health care kicks in. Months. What happens during those months if something goes wrong? So people are scared to lose their job or they're scared to quit their job and go try something new because their insurance is tied to where they're working. How much, yes. how much more productive of a society could we be if people had the choice of mobility and jobs so that they could go and truly find something that they truly enjoy doing, how much more productive could we be if yeah. people had that ability to not have to fight for the good job with the good benefits and we're just going to do it even though we hate it because we have to have insurance because we, we have a family and we need to make sure they have proper care. How, how much better can we be as a people if we just took care of our people. Yeah. And, and I think it's yeah. limitless. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is imagine how much better the country would be if people actually were able to get preventative care instead of waiting till they were too sick to actually, Ex you know, take care of themselves. And people don't understand it's more expensive to not have preventative care. It's more expensive for that person to go to the emergency room once it's too far gone, once it's too big of a problem, and when they go to the emergency room because they didn't have insurance, and at an emergency room, they are required to provide care. Who's going to pick up that bill? Who's going to pick up that bill? 
your premiums are going to go up, your copays are going to go up, your prescription costs or whatever, all of that is going to go up. You're going to pay for it. And everyone who says, I don't want my taxes to go up for them to have insurance, as it turns out, you're paying for it one way or the other. It's coming out of your pocket because someone's going to pay for it and it's not going to be the, it's not going to be the hospital and it's not going to be the insurance companies. It's going to be out of your pocket. No. And preventative care is actually cheaper. Way, way cheaper. Yes. Same thing with dentistry, right? People don't understand that if you just, if you just have a cleaning once a year, how much better that is for you, how much, how much missing teeth kills your self-esteem. And how, how deleterious of an effect that is on your life. And I, it breaks my heart to see, to see that happen to people. And it's just because they don't have the 50 bucks a month or whatever for dental insurance, you know, or the, or you go and you, it's cheaper to pull your tooth out of your head than to give you a filling. So they just yank your teeth out. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. So dentistry should definitely be covered in healthcare, by the way. Yep. In case that wasn't clear. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Thank you so very much for that. Now, uh, I want to go to union and labor support. So it says strong labor unions were the biggest backers for a lot of policies that we take for granted. The eight-hour work dates or four-year hour work week and child labor laws. They have fought for unemployment insurance, worker compensation, on-the-job safety standards, and family medical leave. So you talk about how you support strong unions uh, and, you know, uh, uh, here's the thing. Um, You know, the Democrats will say that they support unions, things like that. But of course, uh, just look at how Joe Biden treated the rail workers union. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, He actually showed that to not be true. Uh, So. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is unions are at an all time low here in the United States, a little under 10 percent right now in the state of Florida. The union representation among workers is even lower at six percent. So what measures would you push to implement more unions across the country and more specifically Florida? If I could get rid of every right to work state, that is such a lie that it is some super special right. And as a matter of fact, Florida is a right to work state. I don't know you're aware of that, right? Yeah. That, that essentially says that if you go and work at a union shop or you go and work at a union uh, factory, you don't have to join the union. Well, what's the point of the union? If you know what I mean, you're not going to, you're going to get the benefits from it, but you don't have to pay any dues. I think is I, it's just, that doesn't make any sense. And, and what I talked about in there is we need to understand that every Every commodity has a price. Every commodity is negotiable. If you produce more corn, then you're going to get a little bit lower price for your corn. If you produce more milk, you're going to get a little, it's, it's a commodity and it has to fluctuate. And unions allow us to take the commodity of labor and negotiate it. And people, one of the things I said on there, someone is not doing you a favor by giving you a job you are doing them a favor by selling them your labor. Simple as that. We need to get out of the mindset that creating jobs and job creators are super good people and they're the best of America. That's bull. That's absolute bull. You are selling them your labor. And if you cannot come together and negotiate the price for fair labor, then we've already lost. If people understand, if, if people don't understand that we are a commodity, our labor and our time is a commodity that must be fought for and must be protected, then they've already won. The billionaire class has already won. If they say, come and work for us, it's going to be a favor and we're going to create all these jobs. Well, you're creating low paying part-time jobs with no benefits. You're not creating anything. You're mm-hmm. in, you are, you are underbidding labor from yep. human beings. Yep. Simple as that. Yep, basically. So I have a second question about union labor support. So worker cooperatives are basically businesses that are worker owned and operated democratically in a more horizontal fashion. The necessity for unions is eliminated due to workers' collective ownership. Would you be in favor and push this type of legislation that favors more worker cooperatives in the country? 
Yeah. And actually that interview, uh, Richard Wolf talked about it uh, with Jamie Dore, where essentially the government said, if you lose your job and you get together with 10 people, we'll give you money and you open a business. That's awesome. Why, why can't we do that? That's, yeah. that's a great idea. Instead of paying you unemployment insurance, we're going to help you open a business. You guys all decide on what you want to do and open a business. And then we're not paying you unemployment insurance anymore. We're just giving you all of that uh, up front so that you can start a business. Why yes. can't we think outside of the box like that? Why do we have to degrade people who are on unemployment instead of trying to give them a hand up and try and make our society better? I think we need more small businesses. I think we need a lot more small businesses because we are so overrun with monopolies. There's a McDonald's in every freaking corner. There's a Walmart in every city that's, that's taken all the mom and pop grocery stores and run them out of business. Then you've got Amazon, which is a monopoly, which is shutting down every mall in this country. I don't even know if any malls still exist, but Amazon did that. Amazon <laughs> yeah. did that. And they have all they're doing is taking wealth out of our small towns and yep. transferring it up to whatever yacht they're going to buy next. And we need, we need to take back our communities and we need to do that through businesses. And if that's through opening co-op businesses, mm -hmm. if that's through giving, giving grants or loans or whatever to, to groups of people so that they can open co-ops, then absolutely. I support that unions. Like I said, unions are, are an opportunity to negotiate your labor to a company that already exists, but a worker co-op I think is far and beyond what a union is able to do. Yeah. And one of the things I love that you mentioned was that we can either do grants or loans. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, for people who are on a lower income spectrum, try to get them grants so that they can actually buy, buy you know, build a business. Uh, really, this is uh, democratization of entrepreneurship and creating more entrepreneurs within our country. But also, and shout out to Roger Meadows, who is a frequent viewer of this channel. One of the things he talks about is also right of first refusal, basically being when these companies want to uh, sell or they're being taken over. There's an offer to be taken over by a bigger company. Instead of allowing that to happen, they get right of first refusal, meaning that the the workers are offered to own the company instead of it being sold to a larger company. And so then if the workers do not have the collective money in order to buy the company, they can go to the NLRB and go, look, we want to purchase this company. Can you either give us a grant or a loan in order to buy it? Absolutely. And so the, the federal government amazing. gives them a grant or a loan to buy that company because they get the right to either accept the company as they're on them or refuse it. And so then they're able to collectively own it. And then they can operate it democratically and then make all the profits of image profit share among themselves, which also boosts all the workers from the people who clean, do all the cleaning to the people who coordinate things, you know, throughout the company. So I think that's a great idea because I want to create more people who are worker ownerships, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is um, with respect to unions, I, I've had people come at me and say, well, unions are why we produce all of our stuff overseas now. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was not the union's vote. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was the vote of the corporate board who decided we're going to ship our stuff overseas because we can get labor for pennies on the dollar. It was not the unions that did that. It was never the unions that did that, but people blame unions for gutting our, our middle class and gutting the center of our country. They blame unions yeah. for that. Come on. Yeah, crazy. That, that, that's what the corporate parasites tell you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things I wanted to jump on was this is a policy I did not see on your website that I wanted to ask you about. Um, so the I did not see on their uh, policy about reparations for American descendants of slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as far as uh, this, I want to share uh, this fact about your district as well, because I think this is very important. Uh, so this is Congressional District 4. If you look at the racial makeup, the racial makeup uh, for the uh, district is 30% Black. Uh, so one of my biggest questions to you uh, about this is that do you support cash reparations like the ones that were given to Japanese Americans for being forced in internment camps? And if you are in favor of reparations, uh, cash reparations for American descendants of slavery, 
are you going to push legislation to pay for reparations to American descendants of slavery in Congress? Lineage based. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm for it because it's it's a debt owed for unpaid labor. And we were just talking about labor, actually. I, it's it's a debt that is owed. Um, as far as uh, reparations because of the Jim Crow laws or for redlining or anything, that gets into into things where you can't put a number on it. But cash reparations for the descendants of slavery, slavery, that is a number. We can put a number on that. We can calculate it out. We can say, uh, what was it, 30 acres and a mule? We can calculate out. That's a number. 30 acres and a mule, yeah. Um, so... That absolutely. And the only reason, the only reason I believe that it hasn't happened yet is because they haven't figured out a way that they can take that and put it directly in your pocket and put it directly into someone else's pocket. Like just pass it straight through you to someone else and make profit on it. That's the only reason I think that they haven't done it yet is because they haven't figured out how to monetize it yet, which is a, a disgusting way that our government works, but that's what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it, cash reparations, 100%, 100%. Yeah, um, and I, I want to get this book myself, but it was do by Dr. Sandy Darity called From Pure to Equality. Um, he actually wrote about the actual, he actually helped do the study uh, of reparations and talks about how the reparations amount would be somewhere close to or north of $15 billion. I, I don't want to exactly quote the amount, but it's north of, 15, I'm sorry, $15 trillion. Uh, that's how much it would be. And a lot of people would balk at that. Oh my God, that's so much money. We can't afford it. And then I would go to the people who would say, okay, they did a, you know, there was a failed audit for the Pentagon and they lost over $20 trillion. That yeah, money just actually- oops. Could Just oops. Yeah. yeah. And so mm -hmm. my thing is, it's like, we actually can afford it. Number one, it doesn't, I have to all be paid in cash, uh, you know, in one year. You can actually make it installment payments. Number two, we just have to stop giving money to Ukraine and Israel. <laughs> and we can start getting reparations payments to uh, American descendants of slaves. So, or I mean, make it make it some kind of an annuity or or something that has a cash value each year or something. You know, there there's so many ways to do it, but to just flatly say we can't afford it, well, mm -hmm, maybe take yeah. a mortgage out on the White House because how was that built, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> my people built it, so why not? <laughs> uh, that, that, that was actually a really, really uh, smart, smart, smart uh, position there. I, I appreciate that. Um, so, I, I'm sorry, I got two more questions. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> okay. So, I wanted to talk about also uh, disability. Um, you said you're disabled. I personally am also disabled. Mm -hmm. And so, according to you know, 2020 and the, your census, uh, I and the 2020 census for District 4, I was actually looking at it and you have a good chunk of your citizens are actually elderly. Um, and so one of the things that I was thinking about, especially for those of us who are disabled and elderly, is that our disability and retirement payments are wholly inadequate. So my question to you is in regards to increasing what, first of all, would you be in favor of increasing the disability benefits for the disability benefits and social security retirement benefits? Yes. So those, uh, we talked about COLA before how they, how they do a cost of living adjustment every year, mm -hmm. but that is, I think it's been inadequate. Uh, because it goes on general prices of things, not not cost of housing, right? So a lot of a lot of people uh, who are on a fixed income, the biggest issues arise, especially now here in Florida. The biggest issues arise when your monthly bills go up more than your cola goes up, um, and homeowners insurance has taken a lot of people who are on fixed income and just made it unaffordable for them to continue living in whatever house that they are living in. What just happened with condos? I don't know if you've if you've been following that here in Florida. Now they have they have passed a law after the collapse of I can't remember the condo down in Tampa, but they passed a law and they said condos have to have reserves now. You have to have reserves in case anything mm -hmm. like this comes up. You have to be able to repair it. So instead yeah. of um, instead of saying 
here's here's some reserves or whatever. It's got to come from somewhere. So they're raising condo association dues. So now your monthly dues, instead of being $500 a month or maybe $1,500 a month, they're going through the roof because the condos have a certain amount of time to build up these reserves that they're required to have in the event that they have to do any big repairs. So a lot of people who are on fi- fixed income, things like that will happen. And when those happen, if if your fixed income adjustment, annual adjustment, whatever it happens to be, isn't enough, then you're just going to be kicked out of your house. And where are you going to go live? Where are you going to go live if you're 70 or 80 or, or older and you just cannot make ends meet? There's got to be some kind of a better system. There was a guy in uh, Lake City. He was 90... 91 or 92, he was, he was retired air force and they had raised the rates on the nursing home where he was staying to the point where his fixed income couldn't cover it anymore. And they kicked this veteran out of this nursing home, kicked him out because he couldn't afford it because they had raised the rent beyond what his fixed income was. So you can either, you can do it one way or the other. You can say you can raise the rent, but you can't raise it any higher or whatever than the fixed income adjusted, or you can say, we need to raise the fixed income. Well, I think that the the easiest way is just to say it's capped. So you cannot raise rent or you can't raise X, Y, or Z thing beyond what this person can reasonably pay with their fixed income. We have to, we have to take that into account. Same thing with people who are on disability, who are receiving social security disability. It's the same thing. If you're on a fixed income, there should be controls in place to make sure that you don't get thrown out on the streets. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I mean as, somebody, as somebody that was on disability, that's still on disability, um, I was living in a condo and they had raised my rent uh, over $200 in one year. Mm-hmm. Um, and if anybody on this channel remembers, I actually got kicked out yeah. because they gave me 60 days to leave because they wanted to sell because the the and the, the HOA actually collectively owned my condo and they gave me 60 days to leave. Me and my mother, my mother's elderly, she's in her 70s, to leave. And so we actually we literally had to raise money in order for us to move. And now I'm in a I'm I'm in a new place now. But because of that, you know, we had we had to move. And we were there for almost 11 years. Yeah, that's that's tough. And like I said, there's got to be there's got to be some way that we can protect people that are in situations like that. There's, there's got to be some backstop to that because who, whoever was you were paying rent to, they didn't need that $200. They, they were charging it because they could charge it. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's, that's the worst kind of people. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Definitely. So I have one more question that I would like to ask you. And this one's a pretty ex- simple answer. Can you please explain the benefit of ranked choice voting? Absolutely. hundred percent. And that, that would stop half of the emails I've gotten that are saying, well, you're just going to be a spoiler. We should have ranked choice voting. I, and I think that would be, it would make it easier for third parties to actually come into power, or it would make it easier for people to make the decision to run because I'm, I'm running. I'm not, I, I don't think I'm going to win. I think it would be awesome if I won. But it's going to be really, 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 really hard to win. People can agree with me. They can agree with every policy that I put out there. They can listen to me talk and they can agree with me and say, I would vote for you, but if I did that, then maybe the Democrat would win and I can't do that. Or maybe the Republican, you know what I mean? It's, we need to get over that. We need to, we need to move beyond that. If you look at every other developed country in the Western world, they have more than two political parties. We're kind of getting screwed here. We're kind of getting like screwed. So anything, anything that's, that gives us the ability to have a viable, actual third party or an actual independent movement is I'm for it. 100%. The only thing that I put on there in my, in my policy platform is those, those unfortunately are made at the local level. The U S house, I wish had control over it and I could go up there and vote for it. But the way that the elections are run to get to rank choice voting is, is local. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So thank you so very much. Uh, you know, there's many more questions that I could have asked, but, uh, due to the sake of time, I went way over, but I appreciate you being very long suffering 
and patient with me for the, through this process and answering all the questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. If you can let people know where they can find you and if, you know, what type of help that you need on the ground in order to get your voice out there more in your district. Um, so everyone can find me. My, my website is Todd, T O D D four F O R F L four, um, dot com. So, and all of my, all of my socials are exactly the same Todd for Florida four. Um, I wish I could say I wanted to take people's time or ask for donations or anything like that. I absolutely do not want that. I, I want people to be, and as a matter of fact, my donation page says, give money to local charities and mutual aids. I don't need your money. I don't want your money. Tell people that I'm running. When you go and donate to a charity, tell them you're donating because I sent you or because I said that maybe donating was better than donating to a politician. So I just want to get the word out there that there is a different way to build community. There is a different way to choose our representatives. And I truly, truly hope that uh, I can open eyes to people that say, or to show that this can be done. It's not impossible to do outside of the two parties. All right. Thank you so very much, Mr. Todd Schaefer, for joining me. Of course, if you guys are in Florida, you guys, it, even if you're not in the 4th District, you guys can let your family and friends know who may be in the 4th District that Todd Schaefer is running as an independent. He's not tied to the two-party system. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer, for joining me. All right. I truly appreciate it. Have a great day, man. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.